I know for a lot of you here, some of you have been Christians for quite some time. And one of the things that we often really feel burdened for is when there are a lot of Christians who have been a lot, I mean, who have been a little bit, you know, attending Bible study for quite some time, and yet the maturity level in the Christian walk is not yet that deep. And we, our heart goes out for Christians like that when there's still no maturity that's being experienced. There's still no fruit. And perhaps the Lord brought you here tonight also to realize that, hey, I'm allowing certain things to happen into your life because I'm trying to, I'm trying to mold you. I'm trying to let you understand what it means to follow me. And so these next four weeks, if you attend, if you invest in these next four weeks, these four weeks will be a lot of hard-hitting Christian talk. It will be a lot of really commands and principles and rebuke and challenges that the Bible would have to allow us to understand more because that is needed. Why? Because we need to grow and mature. But the challenge is a lot of, a lot of the things that is happening to us, oftentimes Christians do not understand. A lot of you, when you're here and you're starting up your walk, even for some of us who have been really been attending Big Fridays for a lot of years already, there are certain things in your life that still does not make sense. You stay here, you attend, and there are certain things that you can't understand. Bakit nangyayari ito on all of these things? You know, a lot of those things normally happen to us that does not make sense or we cannot comprehend because one of the reasons, perhaps, that God is allowing you to go through these Testings. These trials is this in found in verse 5. Everybody, can you read verse 5? But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. You see, one of the things that I often find myself reframing my thoughts when my thoughts are being negative, when I thought when my thoughts are being discouraged about my walk. The first thing I try to that the first thing I try to change in my in my way I see things is that Lord. If there are certain things in my life that do not make sense, I can ask you. If there are certain things happening in my life that I cannot understand or does not make sense or it's really discouraging me, I can ask you because that is what your promise have said to us. But if any of you, look, if any of you lack wisdom, so it means it will come to you. It's not, it, it says if any of you, meaning all of us will have to come to a point where we will need to ask God for wisdom. And that's why we're so adamant we're so passionate in bringing people into a small group. That's why all of you here, you attend Friday in, Friday out. The purpose of you attending Big Fridays is for you to be part of a small group. Why is that so? Because we understand that we need to be surrounded by people who would be able to give wisdom to the power of God, to the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when you seek wisdom from the world, you know what kind of problem is? I've seen it. I've personally experienced it. When I hear counsel, when I hear, or when I hear people giving advices, and it's a very worldly advice, it's totally devoid of the wisdom, the wisdom of God's word, the wisdom that only comes from God. And that's why we encourage you, if you're here and you're not yet part of a small group, you need to ask yourself, you need to ask your facilitator, how can I be part of a small group? Because in that small group, you know what? That small group provides a safe place, a safe zone, an area where you could talk, where you could ask questions, where you could discuss, and more importantly, where God's wisdom through people who follow the Lord can be provided for. Kaya po napaka-importante nito. Look, look, look at the verse. It says, Let him ask of God who gives to all generously. The term generously is overflowing. The term generously means it's not going to stop. That is that it, overflowing, that, that is what generous means. You see, most of us, when we think of godly wisdom, when we think of, sorry, when we think of worldly wisdom, this is our normal behavior when it comes to worldly wisdom. Pag nagtanong ka sa isang tao, pag sinabi niya ka na isang beses, sa simula, he can easily or she can easily tell you what's wrong. For example, you ask, can you please tell me the instruction on how to get to Big Fridays? For example, that's your question, right? Someone would explain to you, this is, the, this, is the, this is the way. If you're coming from Makati, you get on a bus, you go down at EDSA, and then you, from EDSA, Ortigas, you get another bus going here, and you go down at the corner of Ortigas, and then you walk towards CCF. For example, that is your question, right? Now, for, for example only, for example, the second time around, you forget, and then you ask again, sir, 
Ano nga ulit pumunta sa CCF from Makati? Then the same person would tell you again how to get here, right? On the third and the fourth. But guess what? On the fifth time, perhaps on the fifth time, the person would tell you, ano ba naman? Panglimang beses ko ito sinasabi sa'yo? Hindi mo ba alam? Right? And then worse, when you go on the sixth, when na nakalimutan mo ulit, you will not, you're afraid to ask. You know why? Because alam mo, papagalit na ka na. Baka sabihin ka pa nga, tanga mo naman, pag anin na beses mo na yan. Right? You know, that's worldly wisdom. But I can share to you what godly wisdom is. Godly wisdom is this. Kahit ilang beso pa tanongin ng Panginoon, He would generously give it to you. Anak, yan ba yung problema? O ito, sakay ka ulit ang bus, pata ka sa EDSA, baba ka ng Ortigas, sumakay ka ng buso punta, pagdating mo sa kanto, maglakad ka sa CCF. Lord, nakalimutan ko ulit. Eh, sorry ah. O sige, anak, ganito ulit yan. That's what it means when it without reproach. There's no, there's no, Character in God would tell you, don't ask me that. Ilang beses mo na tinanong. And that's why a lot of people, when they come and follow God, they think God as a father who, would, who when you ask something and then you forget, nahiya ka na ulit pagtanong. That's completely, totally different from who God is, brothers and sisters. That's why this series, Decoding the Christian Life to Have a Victorious Life, is so critical. And I pray that you would really invest in the next four Fridays. Because most of us, we're not experiencing the promise of God's Word. We're not experiencing the victorious life of a Christian life. You know why? Because we have a wrong view of who God is. Wrong view. And if you have a wrong view of who God is, you will have a wrong approach on who God is. And therefore, the promises that He has lavishly thrown to each one of us for us to experience. We're not experiencing. And that is why the disconnect. It is why we really, really need to ensure and understand that we need a one right view of who God is. We need to have that one right view. We have to have the right, right view in order to desire to have a right relationship with Him. And if you have a wrong view of who God is, then it will affect your relationship with Him. That's what we've been trying to tell you the past four months. You know, we've been trying to explain to you what it means in love, what it means about work, what it means about salt and light. And tonight, as we kick off this brand new series, we're going to talk to you again. What is the right perspective towards God? Because if you do not have the right perspective towards God, you will not desire to have a relationship with Him. And if you do not want to have that relationship with Him, you will not experience the victorious life. For the victorious life are those who call upon Jesus as His Lord and Savior. A lot of people, they claim, oh, Christian naman ako, but they couldn't experience a victorious life. Excuse me. You might want to ask yourself, are you in a right relationship with God? Because at the end of the day, that's what would guarantee us to have the right relationship, to have the victorious life. That's why we need to decode this. We need to decrypt this. By the way, it's simple. Hindi po natin kailangan i-decrypt. Wala po kailangan tayo i-decrypt. It's very simple. Have the right perspective of God, of who He is, that will lead you to have the desire to have a relationship with Him. And when you have that relationship with Him, it will unlock, unlock the victorious life in each one of us. That's what decode means, the manual for a victorious life, right? That's why in the next three Fridays, we're going to talk about how to decode that. First, we're going to, we're going to talk about decoding Decoding our conduct. What is the code of conduct? How do we decrypt a victorious character, right? Next week po yan. We're going to talk about decoding the right character, which means how do we become patient in a very fast-paced world? Kailangan mo ba ng patience? Hindi mo kailangan, hindi nyo kailangan, yung mga limang nagsabi ng kailangan nila, yung 300, 55 dito na remaining, hindi nyo kailangan ng patience? Kailangan natin ng patience kasi nawawalan tayo ng patience madalas, right? So next week, we're going to talk about that. The week after that, we're going to talk about the code of endurance. How do we have victory over trials and temptations? Napakaganda! How does faith that endures mean? Wow! Parang gusto ko umatin next week tsaka nung next Friday, ah. And then, last fr- and then on the last Friday, we're going to talk about how do we decode the code of communication? Decrypting victory in prayer, right? Victory in prayer. We're going to talk about how to really pray. How to really, and all of those topics are actually what you told us. You told this, you, remember? You told us this. We had a survey. 
we ask you, among all these 15 themes in the book of James, which theme or which topic would you like to talk about? And you told us, ito pong apat na to. We want to we wanna know how to manage our finances or our resources. We want to know how to manage our patience. We want to understand what it means to manage the trials and temptations come to our life. And we also want to manage how to really become powerful in prayer. So all of these four Fridays, we're going to talk about that. But tonight, right, tonight, we're going to start off with how to manage our finances. Finances. Pakisabi nga sa katabi mo ngayon. Kalabitin mo, ha? Ito, ito tanongin mo sa katabi mo, ha? Mayamang ka ba? Sabi mo. Mayamang ka ba? Mayamang ka ba? Alam mo, sagot mo. Ito sagot mo sa kanya. Ito sagot mo. Ano sa tingin mo? Yan. Ano sa tingin mo? All right. We can talk about that. But the thing is, do I, do I sound funny? Do, do I sound funny or I'm okay? Do you, can, you hear, can, you, can you hear me at the back? Okay, parang, parang ngungo ako eh. But uh, okay. Or baka may, may cold or whatever it is. Okay. But the thing is, let me just give you a heads up. Okay, by heads up. Yung limang, yung anin na verses natin tonight are six verses this evening. It's going to be hard hitting. Una ko na kayo. It's going to be hard hitting. Uh, and so if you're here and joining us for the very first time, bakit hindi ka na next week? But, <laughs> but I hope you would come back because these six verses, it, these six verses are probably one of the most poignant, one of the most very direct, very blunt verses that the book of James contained. And I don't know why, but God allowed it that it's going to be our first session. Dapat pang fifth session to eh. Pero hindi ko alam ba't inuna natin tong ito. But I guess we all need to have to hear all of this. Why? Kaya na una, right? So, it will take us the first six verses of the fifth chapter of the book of James. And we're going to learn how to be wise with your wealth. You know, most people believe that the Bible teaches that it's wrong to be wealthy. If you have a, if you have a shallow understanding of God's word, you would believe or you would think, you would assume, right, that the Bible says that money is the root of all evil, right? But for some of us, or some, I hope all of you here, have a better understanding of that verse. It's not actually, the, it's not actually the, that money is the root of all evil. There, it has to be the love of money, right? It actually says the love of money, not just money per se. It's the love of money, which is the root of all evil. You know why? I, that has to be very clear, because... We're going to talk about wealth. We're going to talk about finances. And the Bible is not our God. It's not opposed to wealth. In fact, if you have read the Bible, you have come across so many individuals, personalities who are actually wealthy, right? Uh, there's Abraham, right? There's Job. There's Joseph of Arimathea. There was even Barnabas. Who, I mean, all the other people. There, were a lot, there are a lot of people in the Bible that are wealthy. So one thing I want to make sure is clear. God is not opposed to wealth simply by being wealthy, right? He's not. But God is very much opposed to the misuse of wealth. Do you follow me? Not just wealth per se, but the misuse and abuse of wealth. He wants us to use wealth wisely. And tonight, the book of James will explicitly tell us that. And no matter how much we have or how little we have at the end of the day, the question is, how are we using our money? our finances, how are we using that, right? So let me take you right away to our first session for the day, which is the code of success. The code of success. And you know, in the middle, in the, middle, in the, in the New Testament times, when James was, was written, actually there was no middle class. In, in the Old Testament or in the New, even in biblical times, there were just like the rich and the poor. Ganun lang po yan. Either you're rich or either you're poor. You, the system, in fact, because of that, the system made it in such a way that the rich become richer and the poor become poorer. It's the sad fact of life back then. The rich tend to manipulate. The rich tend to oppress the people. They were continually being abused. And this book, in this fifth chapter, the author James lashes out at this non-biblical way or unchristian-like approach for the use of money. He will give a rebuke. Again, I said earlier, probably one of the strongest rebuke in the entire New Testament, and he's going to be strong in words, right? And, 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 and although all, of, if not most of you, are not, you know, committing these sins in the degree that the Bible in, in, in the book of James is explaining, this passage is a healthy warning to us 
So we would make sure that no matter how much money we have or how much little we have, we have to use it wisely. So let me go right through it. What are these six verses? Everybody, could you read with me verses 1 of chapter 5 of the book of James, verse 1 to 6? Shall we? 1, 2, 3, go. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Verse 4. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mow your fields, which have been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Verse 5. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Father God, we thank you for this time. And we pray this as we unpack, Lord, these six verses and a couple other verses, supporting verses. Lord, may you just speak to us about this very critical, important topic about how do we use our money or how do we accumulate money or how do we appropriate money and how do we apply this wealth that we have into our lives. Lord, I confess my complete dependence upon you. But Lord, may you use this, this time to really speak to our hearts. Open our minds so we can be transformed by the power of your word as we commit to you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, all right, are you guys ready? All right. You know, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries are coming upon you. You know, one of the things that's easy for you to, to think is that Right off, when binabasa mo to, or I was giving the introduction, some of you might have been telling yourself, this is not for me. Why? Because I'm not wealthy. I'm not rich, right? Come now, you rich. But since some of you might think, no, 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 I'm not rich, so this might not be, totally be applicable to me. Let me just uh, try to explain what this verse means. Of course, when we are going to compare ourselves to Bill Gates, talagang wala tayo. Right? We're really, really, we're really poor compared to that. But rich, as the verse says, is a very relative term. According to a Gallup study, Gallup is a, it's a global network of research data-driven gathering company, one-third, which is about 35% of the world's population, lives on less than $2 a day. What $2 dollars peso? pesos? 100 pesos, right? So if you're here, and you're not, if you're earning more than 100 pesos a day, that means you automatically belong to the upper 60% of the world's population. Okay, that's the first. Second, if you have basic needs, okay, basic needs like water, I know, water ngayon medyo mahirap, okay, pero dun muna on a, on a normal, normal day in the Philippines, right? If you have water, if you have a roof over your head, like, like you're sleeping, may meron kang tutulugan, meron kang bubong, then you have, you have, you have, so, yeah, meron kang ano, bed, kama. Ibig sana, you have kama, parang pangat tignan, ipakinggan, na. You have bed, di ba? Meron kang bed, okay? And then, meron kang doot, suot. I don't see any one of you right now not wearing anything, good, okay? So you all have clothing. You actually belong to the upper 75%. Can you imagine that? By just having water to drink, food to eat, shelter, clothing, and education. So if we are going to define rich as having all of those things, you might actually become a rich person in terms of the global population. Do you understand me? So that means when you are rich, this can actually apply to us. So, yung kaninang tanong mo, sa katabi mo, ang mayamang ka ba? Right? Ang sagot mo doon, given this standard, perhaps I am. Okay? Perhaps I am. Para meron ka, may, may kaunting humility pa rin. Perhaps I am. Right? And therefore, compared to most of them, we are actually wealthy. That's why everyone, perhaps in this room, given that standard, is wealthy. In fact, for some of us here who are blessed to have a car, talagang in in the context of the world, you're actually rich. I'm not saying this just to really 
makes you feel guilty that, that you think you're poor and yet you're rich. And I'm, not t- I'm not talking about that. I'm trying to, tell you, to talk to you about this so that you would understand that when the Bible says, come now, you rich, it's actually something applicable to us. And based on this verse, look, look at the verse. You rich, mayaman, you're wealthy, weep and howl for your misery. Misery. Anong tagalit na misery? Kahirapan. Kasakitan. Okay? When kahirapan at kasakitan will come to you. So therefore, if I'm just going to read verse 1 plainly, it can sound like this. Listen to me. Money can actually lead to misery. Money can actually lead to misery. Wow! I've never thought about that, that money can actually lead to ministry. Do you know why? Because for most of us here, we believe money can give us everything. But the Bible is so clear. The more you are going to be rich, if you're not using your wealth properly, the more chances it becomes that it might provide misery in your life. In ancient Israel, there were some rich people at the top and a whole lot of poor people at the bottom. Ganyan yung biblical times. Maraming konti ang rich, maraming poor. Pero laki po ng difference. And those with, often with money, yung mga mayayaman, they mistreat the people that are poor. And we're going to look at how these rich people, these wealthy people, are not using their money properly. And perhaps, while you're listening, you might realize, ako yun na. I'm actually like that. And for some of us who are not like this, hallelujah, then it could serve as a warning. It could serve as a reminder to us that how to reuse our wealth wisely, even those watching from us live stream on Facebook. Okay? Some of you might not consider yourself wealthy, but based on what we have discussed, you are actually wealthy. So, sabihin mo rin sarili mo yan. Okay? You are actually wealthy in this. By the way, baka mamisquote ako na prosperity gospel to pinapalabas natin dito. Hindi po, ah. Ini-explain ko lang po yung nasa Bible verse. Okay? All right. Let's continue. Let's continue. All right? Now, the problem is this. What happened? Why was James so agitated to them? Well, we could give that a glimpse in verse 3, which says, Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have what? Hoarded wealth in the last days. I have, I have highlighted the word hoarded wealth. So the first issue that we talk about, how do we manage our resources? How do we manage our wealth wisely? Is the first thing that we should avoid is that we should avoid hoarding our resources or our, or, or, or our finances. What is hoarding? Ano yung sabihin ng hoarding? Ano kaibahan ng hoarding sa savings? Right? Kasi that's, that's, there's a real big difference. You know, uh, we're not talking about savings here. The Bible's not talking about savings here. The Bible's talking about hoarding. Hoarding is this. Kapag may pera ka, at ayaw na ayaw mong bitawan yung pera mo, kahit ano mangyari. It's the inability to be able to let, give away money. It's the inability to let go of money. Parang you don't want to buy anything, you don't want to help anyone, you don't want to do anything. Gusto mo lang i-hoard yung pera. Gusto mo lang ilagay sa ilalim ng kama mo, sa ilalim ng unan mo, o sa ilalim ng matres, or in one, you, know, you just want to hoard it, or in the bank. Right? You just want to hold it. Right? It's, it's, it's that. It's, it's, when, it's when spending money becomes difficult for you even if you can't spend it. Okay? It's, it's spending money, but so difficult for you even if you can't afford it. So it's, it's about, about never wanting to give your money to anyone. That's hoarding. And, and because of you want to hoard your money, it gives you this anxiety, your, this anxious feeling that makes you just keep your money. Ito yun, yung talagang gusto mo nang bilhin itong bagay ito, hindi ko bibilhin yan. By the way, hindi po ito yung kuripot, ha? Iba po yun. Hoarding is just really not using your money to what it's intended to be. Okay? That's hoarding. And the Bible says that's the one reason or one thing that you should avoid, hoarding. And so the first thing that we need to understand how to manage our wealth properly, our resources properly is first, how do we accumulate our wealth? What is the accumulation of wealth? God says that money is not to be stockpiled. The Bible says you cannot just get money for the sake of having money. God wants his money or his resources 
or his material blessing to be used wisely. Again, it's not talking about savings. There's a legitimate place for savings. What God is encouraging us here through the book of James, that God's telling us we need to use our money wisely. You know, hoarding is when you get more and more for the sake of getting more. So you can have it. You see the hoarding. You know, I, I, I don't have the time, but I've read so many stories in the internet about people who had tons of money but did not use it. And let me just give you some, some example. There was this millionaire of a woman. He had, he, his net worth by this, by di, uh, it happened over 50 years ago. Eh? But if, his, if her resources were valued at this time, it's about $3.8 billion. And dami ng pera. But the problem is this, because he, she hoarded her money. There was one time her son was sick. Okay? So when he brought her son to the public hospital, meaning no pay because she doesn't want to spend, when she went to the public hospital, the, the doctor said, we need to amputate the foot of your child. And they said, but this, since this is, a public hospital, this is a free hospital, we could amputate it, but you need to pay for the medicine. But the, but the doctors are free. You know what this lady did? He did, she did not allow, she did not pay the, the doctor, so she had her son brought back to her house at doon nila pinutol yung paa. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, just, this is just one of those stories. There's another p- person, she's a miser, she, she was discovered, she was living in misery, she was living so poor, she died alone, but when they went to her house and they opened her closet, it was full of money. I mean, these are the things, these are just real-life examples of people who accumulated money and did nothing. So that's why. Why did they do it? Why did they hoard it? Because they were afraid to losing money, using money. Money became the end of itself. Accumulating had become the goal of their life. They were so afraid of losing money, they were not willing to spend it. I'm sure, hindi kayo nun ganito. I'm sure you're not that. But it, we have the tendency to do that. We have the tendency to accumulate. Look, look at verse 2. It says, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Back in the days, in the biblical days, there are three things that would make a person wealthy. The first is the amount of food he has or they have. If they have a lot of grain stockpiled, that means they're rich. Second, another way to flaunt riches was through their clothes. And then the third, obviously, was through the treasure, the gold and silver. And so as you look into the Bible, there are three ways that the Bible is telling us that we hoard money. First, because the, the, your wealth has rotten. What does rotted mean? Meaning na, bu, na bulok, right? Rotted means the bulok. So it gives you the idea that the food decayed. So one of the things that we actually accumulate things or stockpile on things is that when there are certain things in our life, sample food, that becomes rotten. Alam mo, meron po akong confession. Last Wednesday, holiday, di ba? Okay, so I was, stay, I was just at home last, last Wednesday, and then I opened our refrigerator, and then I kind of saw a couple of uh, Tupperware pla- uh, containers inside our, our ref that has been there since January yata. Hindi naman, siguro mga February, right? Tagal na, tagal na. And so I said to myself, so I started opening them one by one, and I saw, when I opened one, nakita ko, mechado. When I opened that one, I saw it, adobo. So I saw tilapia. So I said, Ma, why are there so much food in our ref? And I said, this is really not good stewardship of food. And, and lo and behold, a day or two after, I came to this verse. Your wealth has rotted. And then I said to myself, Lord, para sa akin pala talaga itong message na to. Kasi your wealth has rotted. That is just a principle I want to share to you. It's not descriptive, right? No, it's not prescriptive. It's, pres- it's, it's really descriptive. I'm just describing a principle. I'm describing a principle that oftentimes we have things that we don't use and just keep it. And at the end, it just becomes rotten. I will assume some of you, you have food in the refrigerator tonight. If not you, if not you, baka your parents or your family. I would even dare to assume some of you have food in their cars. 
Bakit kaya't ipamigay yun? Anong ginagawa nun sa kotse? Anong ginagawa? Alam mo, iniisip ko talaga, seriously, iniisip ko talaga, nakita ko yung mga spaghetti, yung pasta, yung, yung tilapia. Alam mo, nakita ko yun? Sabi ko, shucks, I, I see so many people who are asking for food. And then here I am, in my house, by the way, this is confession time, huh? I'm, just being, I'm just being honest. Here I am, I see a lot of these things. So I told my mama, we need to make a, uh, uh, a pack. We need to make an, uh, uh, time dalawa. You need to, we need to do this. From now on, wala tayong matitirang pagkain dito. Let's make sure that eh, pagka hindi natin maubos, bigay na natin. Or in short, wag tayo masyado magluto. Right? Or, or, or in, in, what, what I'm trying to say is we need to make sure that our resources are properly managed. Do you agree with me? So why don't you do that as well? Why don't you check yourself? Look, moth have eaten your clothes. Do you know, what, you know why moth eat clothes back then? Back then, the dresses are being garnished with so much, you know. Pag nakita mo mga damit ng mga panahon na yun, pag nakita, nanonood ka ba ng mga movie ng mga ancient times, so, may mga damit, mga robes, napaka-elaborate, napadahing mga achuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchuchu
how to donate. Okay? All right. Let's continue. What are, can I tell you exam? Can, can I give you, can, can I just a quick re- review before we leave the first point? When does, when does your wealth become rotted? Kaya nasisira ang pagkain. Kaya nagiging, kaya nasisira yung mga damit. Kaya nagkakaroon ng kalawang yung gold and silver. When, when, do, when does that happen? Kapag? Kapag hindi ginagamit. Yes. When we're hoarding it. That's right. Your food has gotten rotten. Wealth is not to be hoarded. Number one, when it comes to accumulation, don't hoard it. You know what's, why is that so? Because look at the, what the verse says. The verse says, their corrosion will testify against you and eat... Oh, what happened? Your, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Wow. The last part of verse 3 describes how we, can, how, how we own can end up owning us. Look at the verse. Look at verse 3. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Wow. The word testify is the idea of proof. So that means a proof will be against you because you're doing this. Possessions can offer a testimony against us and it await us. us. Interestingly, our possessions rust away. Nagkakala ng nasisira ang mga possessions natin and yet, and yet, over time, and yet, they can quickly consume us. Those who store up treasure for themselves will face judgment in the last days. Wow. So let me ask you this. Everybody, let me ask you this. Do I have money? Or does money have me? Very good question to ask. I ask myself that question. And I asked my and I and I answered by God's grace. I could Lord thank you. Before money possessed me. I was really very stingy. But by God's grace, do my gita. I'm I'm sharing this out of humility and the grace of the Lord. That when the Lord comes to you, and when the Lord convicts you of your sinfulness. When the Lord enters you and you realize that you have a holy God, and when you know, realize that there is a holy God, you see your sinfulness. And because of your sinfulness, you desire to have that relationship with Him, but you're afraid because you're sinful. Then you realize that even though you're sinful, because God loves you so much, He gave you a perfect solution for that. And because of your desire to be with the Lord, you accept Jesus, your Lord and Savior. And then when that happens, something happens to you. He transforms you. He changes your heart. When you now have a right relationship with the Lord, it changes you. And there before, when you have money, now does money have you, right? Why? Because possessions can possess us. Possessions can possess us. Matthew 6, verse 20, 21 says, everybody read this with me. But I lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Look, look at what the Bible says. Look at what Jesus is saying. Don't store up don't store up treasures for you. But look, lay for yourselves treasures in heaven, whether moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Allocation of wealth. Accumulation of wealth. How do we do that? Second point, appropriation of wealth. The second issue he talks about is the appropriation of wealth. So the principle is, God is not only concerned with what we've got, kanina accumulation, what we've got, God is also concerned of how we got it. How we got it. Well, how, do we, how do I say that? Look at verse 4. It says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. Ano po ibig sabihin nun? You have to understand again, in the New Testament, para na magintindihan itong verse ito, in the New Testament, Remember, there's just rich and there's just poor, right? I, I shared it to you earlier. Those who are poor, they, most of them work for on a daily wage. Walang kontrata, people are standing, and you, and, you hear, and you read this in the Bible that there are times where people were standing in the corners and then the, the owners of the vineyard would get them, ask them to work at their garden. Remember those kind of stories? Well, it's the same thing here. You were hired at the beginning of the day, 
you work all day, and at the end of the day, you were given a payment. That's, that's, the, that's the way they do things back then. So now, what happened was, a rich man would go into town, he would get these workers, there were no contracts, no labor unions, no laws to protect workers, and if the boss, if the owner wants to rip you off, which actually happens normally then, you have no complaint. You cannot do anything about it. So you work the entire day, you're waiting to be paid for, at the end of the day, you're not going to be paid. You push in a sabi dito. You put in context that the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, which we have been withheld by you, you're not giving them. So the idea, the principle behind this is that when you accumulate wealth and you appropriate wealth the wrong way, meaning you were cheating, you were dishonest, and that's why here it says, no, you don't do that. So the Bible is not just concerned about when we accumulate wealth, but also how did we get the wealth. And this is what James is criticizing. The book of James is saying that in the accumulation of wealth, don't hoard it. In the appropriation of wealth, don't steal it. That's what the verse is saying. Don't be honest. Don't be dishonest. You know why? Because here's the thing. When, we're dis- when we are dishonest, when the greed of money takes over us, obviously it would lead to only one thing, sin. When we are overly focused on our own finances, we can end up ignoring or blatant, blatantly wronging other people, especially the poor. We take advantage of them. Why? Because of greed. That's why one of the things that we need to challenge ourselves here is the way we do things. Integrity is such an issue in our country now. It's election time now, right? And the way we try to elect people is one of the filters that normally all of you look into when electing someone is, is this guy corrupt or not, right? But the problem is corruption is so endemic that we need to start three, four generations down the road. Not on them, on us, you. We, you need to start now. You need to understand it has to be done with integrity. And that's why we're so, we're so, remember, Ian asked you earlier, are you inviting people to come to Big Fridays? Because our vision is that we fill this place and a lot of people will understand what it means to become a follower of Jesus because we know that that is really how we're going to change this world. And so if you're here and you understand, look, when you think about your wealth, it's not just accumulating wealth, but also how do you get it? How do you get the means of it? And here the Bible clearly says you need to make sure that you are working with integrity. Don't steal. Don't use dishonest means to rip off people. Nowadays, there's so many people who are dishonest. Sobra. You know, one of the stories that I often share is that before, I used to have a business partner. This business partner is into selling used cars, okay? I didn't realize that used cars is such a big business. Sobrang big business. What this, what this business partner of mine before would buy totaled cars in Pampanga. These are, these are cars that are barely three months na na total, na bangga. So, tinapo na. Tinapo na na insurance, tinapo na ng banko. So, what he will do is he will buy that total car, fix it, buy it at a very low price, fix it, and then sell it at such a high price. The margins are abnormally huge. Sobrang laki. And so, when I realized that was this, this, the case, I told myself, no, 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 no. I will teach this business partner of mine what it means to really do something out of integrity. So I told him, when we're going to sell this new car, we need to tell the person buying it that it was totaled, it was wrecked, so that we can tell them in advance, yung bibili mong kotse, nawasak to, ah. Sigurado ko bibili mo to. And then you know what he told me? When we tell the people that that is the case, no one will buy the car. That's wrong, he told me. It will destroy the business. And so I said to him, let me share to you a biblical principle that if you do things right, God will bless you. So are you ready to share with, I told him, are you ready to trust me? And he said, no, I'm not ready. So let me do this then. Let me finance one car. I'll buy it. Okay, I told him back then, I was still not pastor then, because I was still in corporate then, I was still So I I'll buy one car, and then we'll fix it, and I will sell it, my price. And so 
lo and behold, we bought one. I sold it, and then here comes the, after a week or two, here comes the seller. Uh, here comes the buyer. Then the buyer told us, we're going to buy this at this price. They locked it. They were, they, the deal was done. They were going to give me the check. But before he was giving me the check, I told him in front of my business partner, I said, Sir, gusto ko lang po sabihin sa inyo. Na itong coaching to, it was a, I think an Isuzu, Isuzu, uh, no, not a pickup, Isuzu, parang Isuzu van. I told him, Sir, na total wreck po itong coaching to. Wasak itong makina, pero hindi tinamaan, pero wasak yung harap. Tapos yung gulong, pumutok, tapos yung airbag sumabog. I was still t- totally, blatantly, all out, transparency. Then I said, you were supposed to buy this at this amount. I'm gonna give you, kasi with that amount, our, 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 overhead, our, our profit was about 100,000. Most, more or less, 100,000. So I told them, I'm gonna sell this with you, but I'm gonna give you an 80,000 discount. So that, you know what, if you still wanna buy it, it's yours, but if you don't wanna buy it because you, you realize that it's wrong for me to do that, I just wanna be transparent. Lo and behold, the guy said, you're so honest, I will give you I will b- still buy it, but I will not only get it at 80,000 less, I'm only going to get it at 50,000 less. So, I gave you a bonus at 30,000. And so, when I got that, I told my, my business partner, and I shared to him, you see, when you truly pursue integrity, and you really want to do it for the Lord, He will be the one who will bless you. You don't have to, sh- you don't have to cut corners. The, the problem is, the problem is, for some of us, or some of them that are outside these halls that have not experienced Jesus, they will never look at that that way. Because it has to start first with what? The right relationship with God. That has to be the kick-off point. You cannot tell someone, do this, do this, do this. If you don't have a right relationship with God, it's not going to work, especially with money. And that's why we need to have a right relationship first with God. When we have that, then these things follow. Do you, do you follow me? Hello? Okay, did you find that something interesting in verse 4? It says, the Lord of the Sobath. What's the Sobath? Can I just give you a bonus? The, the Lord of the Sabbath is, refers to, when you see this, it's the Lord of the armies. Lord of the armies. It means the Lord of the host. It means the Lord of the angel of the armies. So in short, what the Bible is saying, you want to oppress my poor people? That's what God is saying. You want to oppress the poor people? You know what? Who can defend them? In fact, I'm hearing them. I'm hearing their cries again. you. The outcry that you are going to manipulate and to really get one over with, I'm actually hearing them. I am the Lord of the, I'm the, Lord of the armies. I'm the Lord of the angels. I can do anything to you. And you know when I realized that shocks. The next time you want to manipulate and do one over someone who is poor, that's the promise of the Bible. He's hearing it. Halaka. Ikaw din. Gusto mo the Lord of the armies? You don't want to do that, right? And so it helped me understand. It, it gives us the desire to pause and not ignore the plight of the poor, not to mistreat the poor, not to mistreat the people who do not have the strength to help themselves. That's what the verse is saying. Down to the last two verses. Application. Uh, so we started off with accumulation, meaning there's, there's one way, the, the way to accumulate our wealth is don't hoard it. Then we talked about the appropriation of wealth, meaning don't steal it, do get it in the right way. And now our third point, the third A, is the allocation of wealth. In the allocation of wealth, it's simple. It's, it means do not waste it. Don't just spend it on things and pleasures that don't add anything to your life. Can I ask you a question? Honest question. Are there things in your life right now that do not add value to your life? Madami yan. Meron yung ano? Meron toto? Meron toto? Toto, toto, toto. Tsaka toto, toto, Meron yan. Ask yourself, ano yung mga bagay sa buhay natin? Things, uh, things, material things that don't add anything to your life. Alam ang sabi ng Bible? Look at what the Bible says. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. Folks, hindi po yan beef wanton. Hindi po yan beef wanton mommy, okay? Life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. In contrast, ang katalaga ng Bible eh, yung verse 3 and 4 talks about the poor. In verse 5, it talks about the rich. 
Ano daw yung mga rich? Ito po yung rich, sabi, live luxuriously. Ano po yung sabi ng luxuriously? Luxuriously means excess, excessive. Wanton pleasure is this. Wanton pleasure is lustful. You unrestrained. So when it was going to describe the lifestyle of the rich, it described it as, number one, excessive, sobra-sobra. Second, lustful. Lustful doesn't, doesn't mean just sexual lust. Lustful means if you want something, you get it. Ganun ba kayo? Yung hindi ka mapakali? Tapos meron kang gusto, kailangan mabili mo? Ang tawag po doon, gas. Alam mo yung gas? What does gas mean? Gear acquisition syndrome. Pag meron kasang bagay na gusto, kailangan makuha mo. Ay, wala po, sa, wala po dito sa branch namin. Saan ang branch? Nasa Alabang. Punta ako. Kailangan mo makuha. May mga ganon. Kailangan mo makuha. Ito po yun. You live luxuriously, wanton pleasure, running to excess. You know what? Remember the context. These, these rich people were actually withholding the payment to the poor people. Remember the verse before this? They were holding the money. And you know what? The money that they were supposed to pay the poor people are what the poor people will buy for their food. So in short, what they're trying to do is, while they are living wanton pleasure, habang marami silang wanton money, yung mga tao walang kinakain. Yun po yung contrast, yun yung dynamic that James was trying to kill here. Bakit ganon? Why is that so? Why? Because this shows to us that the heart of the problem when it comes to the wealth is a heart problem. That's the problem. The problem is that when our heart is full of greediness, accumulation, sa akin lang to, I'll do whatever I want to do with my money, I deserve this, I worked hard for this, I'm going to get this, it's easy money, so what? Matalino ako, kaya ako nagawa to. I mean, all of these desire to personalize everything, to make it suit your own reasoning, may it be crooked, is the way to really change our heart, correct our heart, allocation of wealth, right? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6 says, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. What does that mean? She who is self-indulgent is dead even when, the term dead meaning you are dead to your sins. That means there's still no rebirth. That means you are headed for destruction at the end. When you die, there's no rebirth, right? And so when there's no rebirth, it means you're dead. And the way to you to check yourself if there's really, really no rebirth in your life is when you're self-indulgent, when you're doing everything for yourself. Look at, look at, look at verse 5. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Ano po Tagalog niyan? Can I, can I paraphrase this in Tagalog? Pinapataba mo yung baboy para pag pinatay mo yung baboy, masarap. Parang hindi yata maganda yung pagkatalaslate ko. <laughs> Pero parang ganun, right? You, you are preparing the pig so that when they become a hamburger, right? Okay, sorry. Mga vegan people, sorry, sorry. So in short, ganun lang yun. In fact, kung nadidi, kung nahiya, kung nag, na, ah, oh, tayo doon, that's us. When you are self-indulgent, when you don't use the wealth properly, when you're not wise with your finances, you're actually creating more misery into your life because at the end, you will die. And when we die, and you don't have Christ, you will be the barbecue. No, seriously. We will be the barbecue down there, right? And so it says... Please, you're dead even when you live. Interestingly, by the way, remember I told you, for those of you who have been listening earlier, what was the time, what was the time frame when James was written? Anybody? Do you remember? About 10 to 20 years after Christ left, right? So it's like a very new church, right? The, the very, it's, it's, it's the early church. Do you know what happened? 15 years, 10 to 15 years after this was written, or 20 years after this was written, the invasion of Jerusalem happened. The, they destroyed the temple. If you know your church history, in 70 AD, the entire Jerusalem was completely wiped out, destroyed by Babylon, right? So, so can you imagine, if you were in the book of James, you were living there and you were rich, you had all of these things, you would never realize that 10, 20 years after, mawawala lahat ng yaman mo. Because it was going to happen. At this point, they didn't know about it. And so looking back, it would give us an example, an idea of God's wisdom when he says, make sure you use your wealth wisely. Because if not, it can be destroyed if you don't use it properly. Right? 
So what have we talked about so far? Let's, let's close this in. We've talked about so far with, with, on how to be with wiser wealth first, accumulation of wealth, remember that? Review ko lang tayo, review, look at your notes. Accumulation of wealth, money can lead to misery, therefore we need to understand that we should have the way not hoard it, right? Second, appropriation of wealth, my possession can possess me, therefore I need to make sure that I live with integrity. Third, allocation of wealth, self-indulgence can lead us to sin. Finally, our fourth A is the application of wealth. How do we then use our wealth? Verse 6 says, everybody read with me verse 6. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Evidently, in the time of James, the rich were buying off the judges. Do you know that? During that time, corruption was at speak as well. The rich people would buy the judges so that when they sue, manipulate, or oppress the poor, they can get away with it. If they want to take advantage of the guy, they can go away with it. James is saying in this verse, you have condemned and ruined innocent men, righteous men. And they are powers to stop you. Even today, it's happening, right? It's happening when the rich can oppress the poor. So the question that needs to ask ourselves is this. How can we really apply being wise with our finances? How can we do that? How can I steward my wealth so that it would reveal my spiritual health? I keep on coming back to this analogy that if you do not have the right relationship with God, you will not be able to follow Jesus. Again, let me repeat that same analogy. If you don't have the right perspective of God, you will not desire to have a right relationship with Him. And if you don't have a right, a right relationship with Him, you will never be able to follow. In, this, in short, if you're here and you see yourself doing those four A's, you need to ask yourself, how am I really using my wealth because it would reveal my spiritual health? Well, while the Bible acknowledges that the wealth is good, it also repeatedly warns of its danger, right? If you read your Bible, it will often tell you, be careful, be careful with the way you use money. Why? Because here's the concern, here's the problem. When you continually be, to be after money, after wealth, the problem is it often leads people to forget about God. Have you noticed? Kailan ka tumatawag sa Panginoon? Kapag wala kang pera. Kapag may problema ka. Pero pag happy-happy, everybody lahat nasa'yo, you seldom call the Lord. I mean, let's just talk straight. Right? And so, one of the things that made me realize, like, hey, I need to even ask the Lord, Lord, I need to constantly remind myself everything is from you. So any blessing I get, this is from you. And that's why most of us, right, why do we keep on desiring to accumulate wealth? Well, look, look at what the Bible says in how when we accumulate wealth. Luke 18, verse 24 to 25 says, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The New Testament, as I read it, seems to show wealth more as a danger than a blessing. Alamot, the more I read the Bible, the more I realize, you know, wealth is a danger, especially if you're not using it correctly, if you're not wise, if you're not wise about it. Wealth sometimes actually is more, it's not really a blessing. Some of us, we think wealth is a blessing, right? Yeah, indeed, it is, but it's not always a blessing. It emphasizes the danger of having wealth more than the desirability of not having wealth. And Jesus set the tone for this. You know, Jesus set the tone for this. Look at this verse. Who is rich to enter the kingdom of God? Why is it difficult for a rich to enter the kingdom of God? Why is that difficult, right? Let me give you another example as we close this, this, this session for this evening. Let me give you another example. In Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 20, it talks about a parable. Everybody, can you read this with me? And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive, and he began reasoning to himself saying, Watch as all I do, since I have no place to store my crops. I know, I'm sure some of you have, are familiar with this verse or with this, with this parable. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. For some of us, when we read this verse, we say, ay nako, mali yan. Right? Most of us, that's our default. But can I share it to you? You might be surprised. This is actually the dream 
of most of the singles. Really? Really? Yeah, look. This is what I do. Tear my down, burns, build larger ones, and there I will store grains and, to, and, so, and, grains and my goods. Whenever I ask someone, they would always tell to me, what is your ambition in life? What is your purpose in life? Well, I want to be rich. I want to have a nice office. I want to have a nice house. I want to have a good family. I want to earn enough so that at the age of 50, I will retire. You know, naman lagi gusto, eh, di ba? Pag tinignan mo, actually, yan yun. Accumulate enough money, get enough, and then retire. So that you will take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Some of us even, even write down in their, in, their, in, their, in their dreams, I want to have a beach house when I'm 50 years old. Doon lang ako titira sa beach. Yun din po yun. Eat, drink, and be merry. You know what's the problem? Look what the problem, what the, what the Bible says. But God said to him, you fool! This very night, your soul is required of you, and now you will own what you have prepared. Now, who will own what you have prepared? So it's the man who stores up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. So what is the Bible saying? Jesus underscores, again, his teaching about the dangers of wealth in this parable of the rich farmer who acquires so much wealth to secure a comfortable life and retirement, and yet, he's called a fool in his death. As people nowadays, in the workplace. Ask them, what is your goal? Your goal is, I want to retire with enough in my bank account. That's always been the dream. But the Bible says, look, you will be called a fool to do that. Fool. Jesus explains this. If you are laying yourself treasure for himself, look at the Bible, verse 21, if the man who stores up treasure for himself and not rich towards God, he is a fool. Folks, Rich toward God. How can we all be rich toward God? I submit to you, it's improbable unless you have the right relationship with God. I keep coming back to that because this is what it's all about. Wrong understanding of who God is will not want you to desire a right relationship with Him. And for you to become rich towards God, meaning generous towards God, meaning wanting to be with God, rich means overflowing with God, you need to be in the relationship with Him. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, in the world and who dwells in it. God owns everything. If He owns everything, then why does He ask for wealth from us? Have you thought about that? If God owns everything, He does not need our wealth. He tells us to give, to use our money wisely, to give our resources to the people that we need. Why is he saying that? Not because he needs our money. He's saying that so that we could actually appreciate what we have. Because here's the black hole. The more money you have, the more money you want. It's going to be a black hole. But the question is, how can, enough, how can it be enough? Answer, once you start giving it out, once you start giving away, by the way, I'm not saying you to give your money. Huh? When I say giving it out, meaning use your money wisely. Use your money to invest to in people, invest in lives, do something productive. Don't waste it, don't hoard it. He's teaching us the right way to live, it's what the Bible tells us to do. You see, the danger with the wanton pursuit of money is that it would lead us to trust wealth and money more than God. And God will teach us that it's not the wealth, but God alone whom we should trust. I want to end with my testimony. Alam mo, if there's anyone in this room who has been driven for money, I was that. I was a very driven person when it comes to money before I met Christ. I grew up in a very difficult environment. Uh, my sister got sick for 10 years, and so I grew up having nothing, literally nothing. So I had to work myself up to it. So when I came into high school, I was supposed to stop high school. I had to because they, we had no more money to pay our, my tuition, but I had to go and speak to the priest, convince them that I, decide, that I need to graduate from this, college, from this high school. So I did that. When I went to college, I worked myself to college. I, I submitted documentation so that to prove that we don't have any more money so that, my, so that I will be a scholar in college. When I started working, I really worked hard, worked super hard. That There was a time in, in my journey that I was working at probably about four or five years straight on weekends. I really worked myself off, right? But during that time, I have accumulated so many things. My first car, I love it. I gave everything to the car. I changed everything to the car. You know what, you know what happened? My car was stolen, right? Some of you know that already. 
I, I, I lost so many, so many stuff that are expensive, laptops, wallet, ball pens, pera. I lost a lot of things, a lot of stuff. And I realized that God was telling me something. Why am I losing all of these things? Why am I not happy with all of these things? Because the Lord telling me, Alam ikoy, you're looking for happiness in the wrong places. Those things, they might give you total happiness. Temporarily, yes, they will. But it will always be not enough. And so, you know, walang po ako ng kotse. Can I tell you something? Walang ako ng kotse. My prayer was, I was really starting my, my, my walk with the Lord. I said, Lord, siguro you will give me a car, that you will give me a car so I could use it for your ministry. So I decided when I got a new car, I used the car to bring people home in ministry. I started my own Bible study. Simula pa lang. So yung Bible study, sa Monday Bible study, ang hili ko na maghatid ng tao after nagkaroon ako ng panibagong second car, nung nawala yung unang car. So what did I use? I started using my car to bring people home. And so nung down the line, another five years after, I said, Lord, kotse ko po, ang liit, tatlo lang ang kasya. Kailangan ko maglagay ng maraming, Lord, bigyan mo naman ako ng mas malaking kotse para magpagpahuwi ako, magpahatid ako ng mas maraming tao. Then the Lord gave me another bigger car. And so, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, at the end of the day, if you truly want to use your wealth for God's glory, He will bless you. How will He bless you? First, He will bless you to be contented. Not He will not give you a lot. He will give you more money. No, it's not that. He will use what is given to you and you will be comfortable and contented in what you have. Last, last story. When I went into full-time ministry, my only problem was money. Sabi ko, Lord, paano yun? Sweldo ko. Mawawala na. Ubus I mean, of course, when you go to church, it's not the same in the multinational, right? But you know what? The Lord, again, worked in my heart, told me, Ikoy, ano pa ka ba? Tapos na tayo dyan eh. Di ba? When you open your mind and you open your heart, the, main re- the, the, the one of the ways that you would know that your heart is open and your heart is open for the Lord is when your wallet is open. Yun ang isa sa mga reason. Alam mo, pag kristyano ka, pinakamahirap yung pera. Pero when you realize that you're really following the Lord, you're really growing in the Lord, you're really maturing in the Lord, yung money, bigay na. And that's when I realized. In that time, when I was to make, to make the jump with the Lord, I said, Lord, Bakit nahihirapan pa ako tumalon? The Lord told me, kasi yung buong puso mo, hindi mo pa binibigay sa akin eh. E so nung tumalon po ako, nabinigay ko na, wow! Hindi pala pera talaga ang solusyon. Ang Panginoon ang solusyon. Not only temporal, but also, exter- also eternal. And so as we close tonight, let me give you this final topic, this final story. Kunyari lang, to, 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 story to, pero parable lang itong story na to, okay? Do you see that? But that is a, that is a business uh, spread, right? There was a guy, I know this is not a true story, let me just share to you, this is not a true story, yeah? but it's, it good, it's good for, for uh, illustration purposes. There's this guy who saw you the future. Sabi niya, give me, sabi niya, sabi ng isang tao, I can give you anything you want, tell me. Sabi niya, give me the business tax five years from now. So, kinuha niya yung business tax. Takita niya. So, now he knew that because he had the business tax numbers five years from now, he will become a very rich person. Tama? Because he could check what, what stocks are good, he will invest, sure he will be rich. But the problem is, after he saw the business ad, he also saw the obituary. And the obituary was his name. So, all of a sudden, okay, wag po tayo mabigla, hindi po tutro story, <laughs> illustration lang po, Okay? So he, what I'm trying to de- demonstrate here is that kahit ang dami mong pera, kapag mawawala ka na, bali wala na yung pera. Tama po ba? A week ago, my mom had to go to, a, had to, go to a test, an ultrasound and mammography exam because there was, a, there was a concern that she might have cancer. And so I said to myself, Lord, uh, I know, you know, these, things like this really shakes your faith. And, and so I said to myself, Lord, uh, I might not know what the result is, but I leave it all up to you. But during the past, past few days, she had, she had the mammography exam, she had the breast ultrasound exam. Those past few, these past few days, as, as, as I was praying, as listening, lifting up to the Lord, may peace sa akin, but at the same time, I also realized that when there's such a problem, there's other problems, it's just a little bit. Mga naasal kayo, mga, mga, mga bagay na gusto makuha, hindi mo nakukuha. Pag may problema, gano'ng kalaki, nababali wala yung malilit na problema. But, God's, but praise God, the result came out yesterday. It was, uh, it was good result, so my mom did not have cancer by, by God's grace. But the reason I'm sharing that to you is simple. When you come to a point where you have to choose between what is temporal, meaning money, and what is eternal, 
family, friendship, relationship, life after death in Jesus. When it comes to that, money becomes immaterial. It becomes so temporary. So my prayer to you tonight is that that is in our mind. But wealth is not the end. In fact, that's not should that be the pursuit. Who should we pursue? Jesus, God. But you cannot pursue God unless you desire to have a relationship with Him. You will not pursue all of these things. You will not use your man. You will not manage your, your wealth wisely unless you have Christ in you. And so my prayer to you as we close this message tonight is that this, as we pray, can I invite those of you that really do not have Jesus in your life to surrender their life to Jesus? And if you're here, you're not yet certain if you have Jesus in your life, you can be certain. How? Pray to him. Ask him, Lord, I don't want to be the fool that builds up the barn, then obviously it will be taken away because I cannot bring anything to me.